church. Good morning and welcome to Kurt Listening Community Church online this morning. It's really lovely that you have joined us wherever you are from and whether this is your first time or whether you've watched us every single week. It's really lovely to have you here. My name's Alison Henderson. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the children and families worker for the church. So life is still a bit strange and the world is kind of on pause and we're desperately hoping that things will open up again and allow us to see our friends and family in our houses and we'll be able to do things that we used to do. It's a strange time and as we watch the news, sometimes I'm sure we think, what, to, what do we believe and what do we trust? And it's just all very confusing at times. Clive Parnell this morning is going to speak to us from Mark 6 and it's the story where Jesus asks the disciples to trust him. And it's the same for us today. The story is very relevant for us. And it's a reminder that we have to trust in Jesus as well. When everything in the world is strange and uncertain, and maybe in our own lives as well, everything is uncertain and we're not sure what the future holds for us. We have to cling on to that fact that Jesus wants us to trust him and that we can trust him. And that sometimes is easy to do. And sometimes it's really difficult. So we pray that God would speak to us today um, through Clive and through um, our worship and song, reading his word, praying. We just pray that we would really meet with God today and hear from him. So we're going to start the service in worship through some song and um, we're going to then move on to different parts of the service. Hi folks, it's great to be with you again, uh, worshipping the Lord together. I'm going to sing a song that we've maybe not done for a while, or maybe you'd never heard it before. Um, but it's fairly straightforward, and um, hopefully you'll get you'll pick it up and you can join in at home. Feel free to play some percussion uh, on your couch, and um, get the kids to grab some pots and pans and really go for it. And um, we're going to sing, "Lord, You Are Good." We're going to proclaim the Lord's goodness and sing, "We worship You." Okay, you ready? good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. you 
Our good and your mercy endure us forever. Sing, Lord, you are good, your mercy endure us forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. You are good, sing, and you are good All the time, and all the time God, you are good You are good, sing it all the time All the time, God, you are good Sing, you are good All the time, and all the time You are good People, people from every nation Generation to generation we Amen. God is always good. The children in our church are really important to us and we are really missing seeing them on a regular basis. So from everybody at church and especially the kids' church leaders, I want to say a big hi. We miss you and we're praying for you. And we hope that you are well and we hope that we can see you really soon. The Kids Church Leaders, I want to say a huge big thank you to you all for all that you do. You have been so good at adapting to what we need to do, to meeting quickly when we need to meet to talk about things and just for the time and the effort and the creativity that you put in on a weekly basis. I'm sure the parents are thankful for the resources that are going online and the Zoom calls that are happening. So thank you so much to each and every one of you for all that you are doing. Um, it's really, really appreciated. So two of the leaders who are very competitive have decided and agreed to have a little competition, a quiz against each other. So it's Irene against Ellie. So we're going to watch them as they do a little quiz and I wonder who is going to win. And then after that, we're going to hear from two of our young adults, uh, one of which, Emily, came through Kids Church when the church started I think it was about 15 years ago now. Um, Emily was the oldest in kids' church and she was a great mentor to the younger ones and a great help to the leaders. Um, and now she is grown up and her life has somewhat changed, even since yesterday, because herself and Cammie are now a married couple. So it's very exciting. So it will be nice to hear from them. They're going to do the reading for us from Mark 6. And they're also just going to tell us a little bit about themselves 
and share a couple of prayer points that we can be praying for them as they start this new chapter of their lives. So let's watch Ellie and Irene battle it out and then it's a reading from Cammie and Emily. Right, Ellie and Irene, thank you for agreeing to go head to head with a quiz today. So the way that we're going to do this is there are three rounds. So there's a general knowledge round, there's a biblical round, and then there's a creative round. So for the first two rounds, you need to shout out your name if you know the answer first. So I'll give the question, and then if you know the answer, you just shout your name, and then we'll go to you. If you get it right, then you will get a point, and if you don't get it right and it's passed on to the other person and they get it right, they can get half a point. Okay? Is that okay? Yeah. So while, we're, yeah. while you're answering the questions, people at home hopefully can be trying to get the answers before you two do. So it's you two against each other and against the rest of the church, really. So general knowledge first. So I'll keep a little score here. So general knowledge first. So you've got five questions. So first question. So if you know the answer, remember you're shouting your name out first. So first question is, what is the largest river in the world? Ellie. Go Ellie. The Amazon. The Perfect. Amazon. <laughs> One point to Ellie. Off to a good start. Watched a programme on that this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question two. Name the fourth planet from the sun. Irene. Go, Irene. Saturn. It's Saturn. incorrect. It's incorrect, I'm afraid. We have to pass to Ellie. It's Earth. Saturn, Ellie. <laughs> the oh, Earth. No points. You obviously don't know your little mnemonic of my very easy, easy method. Mars. Mars. Just speeds up naming planets. There you go. You always learn something every day. Right, no points for that. Okay, number three should be an easy one. What is the capital city of Egypt? Ellie. I, I, think, I think Irene just pipped that. Just. Cairo. It is Cairo. A point to Irene. My right, scores are one each. <laughs> Very competitive. Okay, question yeah. four. This is quite a tricky one, I think. What is the Elizabeth Tower in London also known as? What is it more commonly known as, the Elizabeth Tower? Ellie. Go, Ellie. The BT Tower. Incorrect, I'm afraid. Irene, any ideas? Is it the Tower of London? No. Good guess, though. It's actually Big Ben. Oh. There you go. Another I didn't little... know that. No, I didn't know either. Right, Ellie, you should get this because your daughter or daughters play this. So I want you to both answer it so it's not... <laughs> so it's not a who gets it first this time. It's a give me an answer and whoever is closest gets the point. So, roughly, how long do you think a hockey stick is? So, we'll go with Ellie first. Depends. Roughly Depends how long you want it. An average hockey stick. Um, one metre twenty. Okay. Irene? Is that three metres? <laughs> Um, what are you going for? Inches? Well, I was going to say about three feet. <laughs> That's a metre. Um, 125. Okay, so Ellie is actually the closest. It's 95 centimetres. Oh. There you go. Which is probably closer to three foot, had you come to that. <laughs> That's very true, very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's your general knowledge. So general knowledge, Ellie got two and Irene, you got one. 
Okay, so we're on to the biblical round. So five questions again. First to get it right gets the point. Who was Joseph's youngest brother? Ellie. Go Ellie. Benjamin. Correct. Benjamin. Correct. Yep, well done. Point to Ellie. Okay, second question. What was Matthew's job before he was a disciple of Jesus? Irene. Go on, Irene. <laughs> he a tax collector. He was a tax collector. Well done. Point to Irene. Okay, number three. Which commandment, so what number, which commandment is you shall not steal? Irene. Go on, Irene. Is it is it the fifth one? It's not the fifth, I'm afraid. Ellie? I'll go for the fourth. It's not the fourth, it's the eighth. Chop off your fingers. Mm -hmm. Don't steal. Eight. <laughs> we learned that at Dynamite, or we we're gonna learn that at Dynamite. So no points for that. <coughs> okay, number four. In the parable of the foolish bridesmaids, what did they forget? Their clothes. What's that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but that's I think I'm wrong. <laughs> Did they forget oil for the lamps? They did. They did. <laughs> okay, and last one from the biblical round. Who woke up after he was married, after his wedding, to find that he had married the wrong person? Oh, Ellie. Right, Ellie? It was Jacob. Correct. That was Jacob. Okay, so that's your general knowledge and your biblical rhymes. And at the end of that, Ellie has got four. Irene has got three. So it's very close. This is the last round. This is the creative round. And this could get you another five points. So Ellie could storm ahead or Irene could win. What you've got to do is you have 30 seconds to draw a picture of either Clive or Colin and the one that looks most like that person wins. Okay, ready, go. This could be very entertaining to see what they think that Colin or Clive looks like. Time is nearly up, ladies. We have ten seconds left. Five seconds. And the time is up. Okay. Hold up your pictures. <laughs> okay, uh, Irene, who is that? Clive. Obviously. <laughs> obviously, obviously. And Ellie? Can you not guess? Uh, I'm guessing Colin. Oh, <laughs> I'm guessing <laughs> Colin. Okay, I think the most like is actually, oh, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Colin actually. I think that does look quite like Colin. So Ellie, you get the five points which means you storm ahead with a grand total of nine. And Irene, you had three points. So well done, Ellie. Good job. Well done, well done ladies. <laughs> I, I'm not feeling smug at all. Really? That'll be a first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Alison. Right. Bye. Bye. Yeah.
Good morning, church. For those who don't know us, I'm Emily and this is Cammy. And as of yesterday, we are Mr. and Mrs. Gill. <laughs> so we've been asked to just share a bit um, about ourselves and um, just let all guys know who, who we are. Um, so we met when I moved to KCC about eight years ago, in 2012. Um, and yeah, we started going out in 2014. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we will now. Um, but yeah, we went for six years. Um, got engaged last year. So yeah, it's been a good journey together. So yeah. Um, so we as a couple in church have um, developed in our gifts from God in different ways. So um, Cami has done stuff with tech and sound um, and I've done stuff with the worship band but we have both together been involved in youth work. So um, probably um, for us in the future, we'll probably see that as a thing that we like to do together. Um, in our in our Christian walk is um, working with youth, um, and we serve well together in that remit, but also well in our other pockets as well. Yeah, so a couple of prayer points, um, just for you, as uh, as we go into married life together. <laughs> so yeah, just the um, the moving into our flat would go smoothly. Um, Hopefully got that all sorted in early November, and um, so hopefully that will go well. Um, and also both just starting new jobs. New jobs. So um, yeah, it's all going to be a whirlwind year. <laughs> um, so just that all goes smoothly. Um, and also I'm working from home, so that's interesting. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's us. Thanks. <laughs> Today's reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 43 to 56. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. When he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was great against them, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them. And the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they were, as soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold But the Lord tests the heart of his child Standing in all purity, God, our passion is for holiness. Would you lead us to the secret place of praise? Jesus, Holy One, you are my heart's desire. You're the King of kings. My everything You want to set this heart on fire So Father take this offering With our songs we humbly praise you You have brought your holy fire to our lips And standing in your beauty Lord your gift to us is holiness. 
Would you lead us to the place where we can sing? Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. We praise and worship you indeed this morning, our Lord and our God, for your wonderful love, your compassion and your grace towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus, to die for us on the cross, die willingly to redeem us and save us so that we might indeed be called even the children of the living God. Lord, we praise and thank you for all that this morning. And Lord, we bring this morning before you our world, our country and our nation, especially at this time of pandemic. We pray, Lord, for wisdom and guidance for the leaders at all levels as they make important decisions, that they will seek you and seek your direction, Lord, so that they might make good decisions to save lives, to protect the welfare of people, and to help those who are suffering as a result of what is happening. And also, Lord, we remember those who are suffering for very many other reasons. Those who are suffering due to war and famine, or ill health, or bereavement, 
or deprivation, Lord, we bring them before you. We pray that you will help them to reach out to you and find in you the peace and the provision and the healing that only you can give. And Lord, we bring ourselves before you, our community, our church, KCC, and ourselves. Lord, we thank you for KCC. We thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy, for the love, for the unity. Help us not to take these things for granted. And we pray, Lord, that you will protect us, that you will protect these values that we hold on to, despite the situation we are facing just now. And for our young people as well, we pray, Lord, we pray that you'll help them during this difficult time in their lives, in this time when they are developing and growing. We pray for protection for them, for their physical, emotional, mental and spiritual protection, Lord. And for the students who have are in college or at university or have not been able to go there at all, as a result of what is happening. Lord, we pray that you will encourage them, that they will not be disheartened or disillusioned, but they will seek you and your direction, along with us, with all the thoughts that we will seek you, Lord, and that we will come to know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly through this time. May we experience your love and your grace in abundance which you so willingly shower upon us and help us to share that love with others, the love that can bring peace in all circumstances. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, his most wonderful, worthy name. In Jesus we ask. Well, good morning to KCC and welcome to this morning's online KCC service. Thank you for joining us and we're going to be continuing in our series, Who Do You Follow? Today we're going to be thinking specifically about called to trust Jesus and we're thinking from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. So if you've got a Bible, it'd be great if you can get hold of one of these and just get it ready for tracking with me during the sermon and when we get to those points we'll be looking at those in the bible and i'll have slides behind me for illustrating other points so let's pray together and ask for god's help father we thank you for this opportunity to come together we thank you that your word speaks truth into our life we thank you that you help us to understand this by your holy spirit and so we're asking for your holy spirit's help in both as I preach, but also as we listen. And help us to not just be those who preach or listen, but to be hearers of your word and doers of your word. So we pray for transformation in our lives. Help us to become more like Jesus. Help us to live out the goodness of the gospel. Help us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're thinking about called to trust Jesus, looking at Mark 6. And I want to draw out three key points from this text that we have. Uh, I want us to think about trust Jesus to direct us, trust Jesus sees us, and trust Jesus is with us. So that we trust Jesus to direct us, trust Jesus sees us, and trust that Jesus is with us. And these are really uh, simple but profound points that we're going to see in quite a short text as we go through this, that we are called to trust Jesus. If you're from Edinburgh or you've lived in Edinburgh for long enough, you will be aware of the ha that can come in across Edinburgh. And the ha is a sea mist, as it were, that comes in off the fourth, that normally in the spring and the summer when it's a lovely sunny day, and it's really hot and as that heat goes over the 
the cold water, we get this ha coming in. And you could be in Princess Street and it'd be a lovely sunny day and suddenly this ha, this mist, as otherwise known around the world probably, comes up Princess Street and you can quite clearly see Edinburgh Castle and suddenly it seems to disappear behind this ha. Or you can go to Waverley train station and you're heading for a train and suddenly it seems to disappear behind this mist. Or you're walking along and you see Scott's Monument and it seems to disappear. What was big is suddenly hidden. And so when it comes to trusting God, it can sometimes feel like that there is a spiritual mist, there is a spiritual heart that rolls in. And at this time that we're in, this time of a global pandemic, it can also feel like that. For some months prior to this pandemic happening, I was preaching about a sense of change coming in the desire to see revival, in the desire to see that God would bring about change, that God would revive this land as we humble ourselves, as we repent, and as we pray that we would see God at work. And that's still the desire. But in praying and preaching towards that, we suddenly see this sort of gear change and if you like this mist coming in where it seems that so much is uncertain that God is still there, God is still at work, he still wants to save, he still wants to change lives, but there seems to be uncertainty and there seems to be uh, a mist that's descended where we cannot quite clearly see the direction of travel. And I wonder whether you feel like that in your own life today, whether it seems as if God seems distant. It seems as if the prayers that you pray don't seem to be answered, or at least not answered in the way that you want. It seems hard to read your Bible. It seems hard to connect with others and pray. Well, God is still present and Jesus is still for us despite that spiritual ha that might be present at times. And we're going to see what some of that looks like in terms of following him in challenging times and trusting in Jesus and what that actually looks like in this text. So we're to trust Jesus directs us. Well, how do we see that in Mark 6, 45 to 47? Let's read that together. Immediately in verse 45 of chapter 6, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. So Jesus directs us and he directed the disciples very clearly And it's quite a sort of stark image here when we think about it. This image behind me is that of the Sea of Galilee and some of the hills and the mountains around them. And Jesus, having been ministering with them, having fed the 5,000, then says to the disciples, go on ahead of me. He wants them to trust his direction. So far, they've done everything with him. They've been with him, they've traveled with him, they've seen him speaking with people, praying for people, talking with people, demonstrating the kingdom. And yet now he says, I want you to go on ahead of me. And he dismissed the crowd and then he went up on the mountain to pray. So the disciples are there in a boat in one place and Jesus is in a very different place. And he directed them, he directed them very clearly to go ahead of him. And so we need to trust Jesus directs us through his word. He speaks truth and we need to trust the word that he speaks to us. Trust that he has a plan for us. Trust that he's directing us. And it may have felt scary for the disciples to think, well, why is he going off and leaving us? and sending us ahead. I thought we were to follow him. I thought we were in this together. I thought that we did everything together. Really helpfully, Paul Tripp says that God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you 
what you could not achieve on your own. Let me read that again for you. It takes a while to sink in. God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. So that the disciples were sent off to go off on their own and it wasn't their intention to do that on their own. They wanted to go wherever Jesus was leading them and they wanted to go with him. And so in life, God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce what you could not achieve on your own. Well, what does that look like? We see for some of us, he's, he's taken us into a job where we maybe didn't intend to go, but he's teaching us patience in that job. He's teaching us to love our work colleagues. He's teaching us to be patient and to trust him and that our work is not everything. For some of us, he's taken us down a route of ill health and we wonder sometimes what is going on. But what he's producing in us is trust and patience. He's producing in us perseverance. He wants to produce in us more Christ-like qualities. For some of us, there are challenges both seen and hidden in our lives where he wants to intend that we would depend on him in these challenges in order that by his grace he will do a work in our life and that he will produce the fragrance of Jesus in us so that when people look at your life and my life they see that we're becoming more like Jesus because he will take you where you haven't intended to go and also to produce what you could not achieve on your own. And ultimately that is that we are saved by grace and we live by grace and we demonstrate the goodness of his grace by the way that we live and trust him. And so people might say to you, what's your five year plan? What are you doing at school? What exams are you doing? Where are you going? What are you gonna do with your life? And that we have to have this plan and intention. It's not wrong to have plans, but the disciples, were told very clearly, go get in the boat, go ahead of me, I'm off here to pray. And they had to trust Jesus. And Jesus did this for a reason that he wanted them to learn what it is to trust him for direction in a way that they'd never done before. And often this happens in our life, that we're going through something and we almost are going down a road and we come across potholes. If you ride a bike, you'll know what I mean. You'd sooner go down a road that's smooth than having to avoid all the potholes. But sometimes there's a roadblock and he takes you in a different direction and he takes you down that different road for a reason, because he wants us to learn to depend on him and to grow by grace. And that is what he was doing with the disciples. And then we carry on in verses 48 uh, to 50. We see he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So here we see that they are in the boat, in the sea, and Jesus is on the land. And I think there's a really profound point to make here, is that though they were in trouble, though they were roaring against the elements with these oars and struggling to find their way, Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them from the land. He saw them in trouble. He knew where they were. And amazingly, Jesus sees us. He sees you today, even though it means there might be a siha around you and you're struggling to look for direction. Even though it might feel that God is distant, Jesus sees you today. Jesus sees you and he knows you. Jesus knows you by name. He sees you and he knows you and he knows you by name and he calls you to himself. 
And that is really important for us because we tend to think with a perspective about us thinking about who Jesus is, where God is, and it all revolves around our own perception. But when we take a step back from that, when the disciples took a step back from that, Jesus was on the land and he could see them. He saw the troubles that they were in. He knew the troubles that they were in. He knew them by name. He'd already called them by name as he does to us as we put our faith and trust in him. And so we see in these verses that he saw the disciples straining because the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, so he's, this has gone on through the night. We're coming into the dawn now. This is not just that they were in trouble for five minutes. This has been going on, it seems, all night. He then went out to them. He saw them. He went out to them and he walked on the water. Incredible, walked on the lake. So it's just a reminder that Jesus is the Son of God. He is majestic. He's able to walk on the water. He's able to demonstrate the power of God. He went out to them, walking on the lake, and it says he was about to pass them by. But when they saw him, when they saw him walking on the lake, they cried out to him. So he knew where they were. He was available to help them. He was available to intercede and to interject into their situation. But when they saw him, they were amazed and they cried out, but they were also terrified. So there's this reminder that actually it's one thing to be amazed about who Jesus is. It's one thing to be terrified about Jesus, but it's actually another thing to trust in Jesus and to see him as our savior, as the one who has come, who knows us by name, who calls us by name and is willing to give his life for us. And immediately he spoke to them. And notice what he says. He doesn't say, well, I told you to go ahead and you're really a bunch of slackers. You really did not do what I asked you to do. He doesn't kind of go heavy on them in that way. He's gentle and he's kind. And he says to them, take courage, take courage. Don't be afraid. He says, it is I. And that's important because he's revealing this Yahweh, this I am. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. So he comes and he meets them in the midst of their turmoil. He sees them. He's already been directing them. Now he sees them and he sees them and he sees us. And he says to them, take courage. Don't be afraid. And, he, and it's so easy for us in the age that we're in to maybe be afraid and to not take courage, but to be discouraged. And I want us to be able to see this picture of Jesus as the one who sees us, as the one who comes to us, and that will take courage, that will pray, Lord, give me courage when it's easy to feel discouraged, when it's easy to feel afraid. Would you fill us with your courage? Would you enable us to know your presence, that we would not be afraid, that we know the goodness of Jesus, that we know the closeness of Jesus with us? And Psalm 56 verses three to four say, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And isn't it interesting, this, this confirmation of this Psalm, the, the Psalmist cry, that he says, when I'm afraid, so it's not that we're not going to be afraid. That becoming a Christian doesn't mean to say that suddenly you stop being afraid. But that when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. So when I'm afraid, I can try and deal with it in my own strength, try and deal with it in my own way, run to whatever I find and escaping. Or I can put my trust in Christ. In God whose word I praise, that we can lift up our eyes in worship and not worry. It's easier said than done, I know, when things are coming in on you on a Wednesday or a Thursday or Friday, when the week is busy, when kids are running around, when you've got bills to pay. But it's putting our faith in Christ, our trust in Christ and praising him and saying that I will not be, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So it's remembering this eternal perspective that Jesus gives us hope, not just for now, but for eternity 
when we recognise that Jesus has come and has died and has risen again, has defeated death, ascended to heaven, will come back one day and make all things new. And the third point that we're pulling out here is that we trust Jesus is with us. Look at verses 51 to 52. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Okay, so we've got this first bit that's easier to understand. They climbed into the boat with them then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. Great. So he came to them. He knew them by name. He saved them. He got into the boat and the wind died down. Incredible. His presence was enough and his authority was enough that the wind died down. And they were completely amazed. So they were amazed as we would be in such a circumstance as many others. But it says, for they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. So this is a really significant point to make. We can be amazed by Jesus. We can know about Jesus. We can come to church. We can sing praises. We can be involved in Sunday school, be involved in youth ministry, be involved in caring for the poor. We can be amazed about Jesus, but not really truly know Jesus. Our hearts can be hardened as theirs were in this circumstance. Well, what does this mean that their hearts were hardened? Well, it's a reference back to the context that just before that of the feeding of the 5,000, that they've been hanging out with Jesus, they've been seeing Jesus's ministry, that they by now should recognize that this is the Messiah, this is the King. That the reference to the bread and the hardening of the heart is as, as back in the Old Testament, as Israel was provided with manna from heaven. And so the great I am is providing 5,000 people with bread. He's not just running some supercharged soup kitchen or some kind of provision for the poor just for some kind of an amazing trick. He's mirroring what's going on in terms of God providing manna for those in Israel in the wilderness. And he's demonstrating that he is the great I am. He's demonstrating that he's not just a guy who does some amazing things, but he's the son of God who will provide for us the bread that we need for eternity. And they hadn't understood that. They hadn't understood the significance of Jesus feeding the 5,000. They hadn't understood the significance of him now walking on water and demonstrating that he truly is the Messiah, the King, the Son of God. And Alan Cole in his commentary, the Tyndall commentary, says that the smallness of faith is a failure to remember God's working in the past and to apply that knowledge of his nature to our present problems. The smallness of faith is a failure to remember God's working in the past. So they'd forgotten really, okay, this is the story of Israel. God was faithful to his people, then they exercised faith. So it's, we fail to remember what's God in the past when we have smallness of faith. And we fail not only to remember what's happened in the past, but to apply that knowledge to our present problems. Have you noticed that in your own life? And I noticed that in my life. That when the storms are raging around us, it can be easy to forget, well, how has God been faithful to me in the past? I've faced these problems with my family in the past. I've faced these problems in work. I've faced these problems in ministry. And how has he helped me in the past? We can so get caught up with the waves that are splashing around our face in the moment that we forget to stand back, remember, give thanks and pray. And so we are to trust that Jesus is with us, that Jesus got into the boat. He calmed the storm, but he showed them that he was truly God. And so as we come to a close are we going to just simply move around in a spiritual heart? Or are we willing to see that Jesus is there despite challenges, despite struggles, despite trials, despite uncertainties? 
It may be right now that you feel so pressured in your work. It feels like you cannot get everything done by the end of the day. It just feels like this mist is around you. Well, trust Jesus to direct you as he has done in the past and seek out his help through prayer. Trust that he will change and transform you in your situation. Maybe you're in a situation where it just feels like it's so pressurizing with your family for a whole range of circumstances right now. It just seems like a great miss where God seems to be distant. Well, Jesus is there. He sees you. He knows your struggles. He knows your challenges and he is with you and his grace is enough. Trust him today. Maybe this mist is that actually we don't know Jesus, that we are somebody who's never put our faith and trust in him. And that actually there feels like this divide. We can put our faith and trust in him today, knowing that he will forgive us and that he will make us right with God for now and eternity. And we can hear all this and we may have put our faith and trust in Jesus. We may see he directs us. We may see that he is the one who sees us and that, that Jesus is with us. But I wonder sometimes if we see this a bit like a contract rather than a deep growing relationship. What do I mean by that? Well, as I close, this is what I mean. Is that we can say that we've put our faith and trust in Jesus that we've repented of our sins, that we see that Jesus is our saviour and that we will one day be with him in heaven. But what does that mean for now? You see, if it's simply just a case of like signing a contract, like I am going to do this deal and I will then have eternity with Jesus, then actually we don't quite fully understand how this works because this is a covenant relationship that we enter into with Jesus that actually we can know the Father and the love of the Father. We can know the love of the Son changing and transforming us into his likeness and we can know the work of the Spirit sanctifying us and enabling us to live in the power of the Spirit, to be a new creation, to live in a different way. And so it's not just a case of I signed a contract, I did a deal, I'm one day going to heaven. But that we trust in Jesus now, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And that we ask that we become more like him now. That as we seek his face and as he changes us, that I should become kinder, more compassionate, more loving, caring for justice, caring for the poor, caring for my neighbour, loving others, preferring others over myself, because that is Christ-like. And so to trust in Jesus fully means that we will see transformation. And so that you should see that in my life, and I should see that in your life, and I should pray for that in your life, and you should pray for that in my life. And as a church, we should pray that as we trust in Jesus, that we haven't just done some contractual deal, but that actually as a covenantal community, we will see us growing in love for him and each other. That we will see a difference as we do that, and we urge and encourage one, uh, one another on in that, that we should be asking one another, how are we doing in that area? What can I pray for you in terms of your walk with God? Let us encourage one another to keep trusting in Jesus. So what's our response? We are to trust Jesus to direct us. Let's pray that indeed he would direct us as individuals, as families, as his family of God in KCC. Would he direct us at this time? We're to trust Jesus sees us so that if at the moment we're challenged, we're struggling, we feel that God is distant, know this assurance that Jesus sees you, he knows you better than you know yourself. And that we're to trust that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is with us in the boat, that he loves us, he cares for us, and he wants us to know him. May we desire to delight in him and know him today too. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this truth that we're taught in these few verses of Mark, that we see how much you love us and you love the disciples. And your desire for them was not just to simply be amazed 
by you, not just simply to be thinking how great you are, but to know you and to trust you and to put their faith in you and to be changed by you. And so my prayer is, is that we would do the same too. Help us to trust you, to be filled with courage, give us your boldness, give us your compassion and passion and fill us with your spirit that we might truly know that we are yours and that we know that assurance changing us day by day. And so help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much for listening. And as always, we would love to hear from you. There is no way that everyone out there watching this is perfect. There's no way that anyone out there doesn't have any challenges and problems at the moment. And so Colin and I would love to hear from you. What can we pray for you? Uh, what can we talk with you about if you need uh, help, direction, spiritual guidance? Um, we would love to hear any questions that you've got, uh, any concerns, any comments, and how we might be able to help you um, as part of this community that we've been talking about. So I pray that you will indeed trust Jesus this week as I look to trust him too by his grace. Thanks so much for listening. God bless, have a great week.
thanks so much for being with us this morning. We hope that you have been blessed through the service. If you would like to get in touch with us, then please do so through the website or the Facebook page or the email address that will be coming up on the screen. It'd be great to hear from you. And if we can help you in any way, then we would love to be able to do that. And Colin or Clive, one of the pastors, they'll be in touch with you. Also, if you'd like to give financially to the work of the church, then please use the QR code that is on the screen just now. There's lots of things that the church is still doing and for it to run and financially, um, it would be great to have your support within that. So thank you again for joining us this morning and we really hope that you have a good week, a blessed week. And if you're around Kurt Liston and you would like to come and join us for the light trail, remember that is happening from today until Saturday where we can be spreading the light of the world around the people in our community. So get in touch with us if you'd like to be part of that this week. Have a good week. Bye for now.